In this video on Programming Next Steps, we look at recursion. So recursion is when a subroutine, often a function, calls itself for within its own subroutine. A recursive subroutine should exhibit three characteristics. One, contain a stopping condition, known as a base case. Two, for any input value other than the stopping condition, the subroutine should call itself, that's the recursion. And three, the stopping condition should be reachable within a finite number of times. Without these characteristics, a recursive subroutine may call itself indefinitely, resulting in a stack overflow. To fully examine the concept of recursion, Let's write some code that produces the factorial of a number supplied by a user. The factorial of a non-negative integer is the product of all positive integers less than or equal to n. In mathematics, this is denoted as n explanation mark. For example, 4 factorial would be 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, or 24. As this problem will perform the same operation, that's the multiplication, again and again to produce an answer, your first thought may be to use an iteration construct. Here we can see a function called factor underscore it. It is taking a single integer, n, as a parameter. Let's imagine the user has called the function and passed it the value 3. We start by declaring two variables, counter and answer, and both are currently null. We then initialize both variables to the value 1. We now enter a for loop for counter equals 1 to n. n is 3, so this loop will execute three times. There is a single line of code inside the for loop, answer equals answer times counter. So that means answer equals 1 times 1. We have reached the next statement, which causes the counter to increment to 2. Back inside the for loop, the single line of code executes again, so now we have answer equals 1 times 2. We reach the next statement again, so counter increments to 3. Back inside the for loop, the single line of code executes a third time, answer equals 2 times 3. We hit the next statement, which increments the counter to 4. This time, when we check the conditions for entering the for loop, we see they're no longer met. We skip past the for loop to the function's return statement, which outputs the value held in answer, which is 6, before the function ends. We successfully calculated the factorial of 3 using an iterative approach, in this case a for loop. Here's the function rewritten, this time using recursion. The first thing to notice is there are fewer lines of code. But this code performs the same function as before, except it's now using recursion instead of iteration. As before, we have a function, this time called factorial rec, which takes in a single integer, n as a parameter. So let's call this function passing in the value 3, just like we did before. We start with an if statement, if n equals 0, then. Well, n doesn't equal 0, it equals 3, the value that was passed in when the function was called. So we jump to the else section of the if statement. At this point, we hit an interesting line of code. Factor underscore rec equals n times factor underscore rec n minus 1. Now, this is where the magic happens. The return value of factor rec becomes equal to n multiplied by the value returned from a brand new call to the function factor rec, but this time passing in n minus 1. The function has just recursively called itself. The original copy of the function is paused, and we now execute the new copy of it. Now don't worry if you're finding this a little confusing at the moment. This is a valid recursive function as it meets all three of the conditions we outlined at the start of the video. One, it contains a stopping condition or a base case. For any input value other than the stopping condition, the subroutine recursively calls itself. And the stopping condition should be reachable in a finite number of times. 
So let's work through this recursive function in detail so you fully understand how it works. Here's the entire program. It includes a subroutine called main that passes in the integer value four and then eventually should output the results of calling factorial rec. So that's four factorial, four times three times two times one. So it should eventually output 24. On the right is an abstraction of the stack in memory. We're going to use it to keep track of two important details. The first column holds the content of the variable n. The second column keeps track of which line of code to return to as the algorithm recursively calls itself and starts to unwind. Currently, the stacks are empty. The program starts at line 9 and proceeds to line 10. Here we call factor rec and pass in the value 4. We now jump to line 1 and at the same time push the value 4 onto the end stack to show that the variable n has taken on this value and push 10 onto the call stack as that is the line of the program we'll need to return to when the function exits. We have an if statement if n equals 0 or n is not equal to zero, so we skip to the else section, line five. We hit a recursive function call, calls factorial rec again, but this time passing in the value of n minus one, so that's three. We're now executing a brand new copy of the function factorial rec. We've passed in the value three and pushed it onto the n stack. Once this copy of the function exits, we will still need to return to the original copy. So we have also pushed five onto the call stack. We reach the if statement again, if n equals zero, or n is still not zero. So again, we skip to the else section, line five. We hit another recursive function call. Once again, we call the function factorial rec and pass it in the value of n minus one. Well, n is currently three, so n minus one is two. We're now executing a new copy of the function factorial rec. We've passed in the value two and pushed it onto the stack. Once this copy of the function exits, we'll still need to return to the previous copy. So we've also pushed five onto the call stack. We reach the if statement again, if n equals zero. Well, this is still not the case. So we jump to line five. Next, we hit yet another recursive function call. Once again, we call the function factorial rec and pass in the value of n minus one. Well, n is currently two, so two minus one is one. We're now executing another new copy of the function factorial rec. We've passed in the value one and pushed it onto the stack. Once this copy of the function exits, we'll still need to return to the previous copy. So we've pushed five on again, so we know which line to return to. We reach the if statement if n equals zero. Well, it's still not the case. n is still not zero, so we skipped the else line five. We hit yet another recursive function call. Once again, we call the function factorial rec and pass it in the value of n minus one. Well, n is one, so one minus one is zero. This time, watch what happens carefully. We're now five levels deep into our recursive function. And finally, we have a situation now where n does indeed equal zero. We've hit the terminating or stopping condition. The stack of recursive functions will now begin to unwind. We've reached line three. Factorial rec does indeed equal one. This is the return clause of the function, and we will need to return this value to the previous copy. But how do we know where to return to? Well, when we hit the end of a function or its return statement, we pop the values off the top of the stack. These values tell us to return to line five of the previous copy of the factorial rec function and pass in the value one. Having returned the previous copy of the function and passed in the return value one, we can finally evaluate this expression and complete the assignment statement. We have n, which if we look at the top of the stack is one multiplied by one, one times one is one. So factorial rec is assigned the value one. We've hit a return clause of this function and we'll also need to return this value to the previous copy. Again, after we've hit a return statement, we simply pop the values off the top of the stack. 
These values tell us to return to line 5 of the previous copy of Factorial Rec and pass in the value 1. We're starting to unwind the stack. Having returned to the previous copy of the function and passed in the value of 1, we can finally evaluate this expression and complete the assignment statement. We have n, which if we look at the top of the stack is 2, multiplied by 1. 2 times 1 is 2, so factorial rec is assigned the value 2. We've hit a return clause to the function and also need to return this value to the previous copy. Again, as we've hit a return statement, we pop the values at the top of the stack. These values tell us to return to live 5 of the previous copy of factorial rec and pass in the value 2. We're continuing to unwind the stack. Having returned to the previous copy of the function and passed in the return value 2, we can finally evaluate this expression and complete the assignment statement. We have n, which if we look at the top of the stack is 3, multiplied by 2. 3 times 2 is 6. So factorial rec is assigned the value 6. We've hit a return clause again, and as before, we pop the values at the top of the stack. These tell us to return to line 5 of the previous copy of factorial rec and pass in the value 6. We continue to unwind the stack. Having returned to the previous copy of the function and passed in the value of 6, we can finally evaluate this expression and complete the assignment statement. We have n, which if we look at the top of the stack is 4, multiplied by 6. 4 times 6 is 24. So factorial rec is assigned the value 24. We reach the final return clause, and as before, we pop the values of the top of the stack. These tell us to return to line 10 of the subroutine sub main and pass the value 24. We've finished fully unwinding the recursive function. The stack's now empty, and we write the value 24 to the screen, the result of performing factorial 4. 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Here are both approaches to solving the factorial problem, one using iteration and the other using recursion. Which one do you think is more efficient in terms of memory usage? Well, in this situation, the better option is actually using iteration and a for loop. Recursion is not very memory efficient. Every time a recursive function calls itself, as you just saw, the processor needs to remember where it was before it jumps to the new copy so it knows where to return to later. The processor also needs to remember the values of all the previous variables as they're local to those copies of the recursive function. And this is done using stacks, which takes up space in memory. Remember, if you have a recursive subroutine that calls itself too many times before reaching its terminating condition, you could run out of memory and cause the program to crash, known as a stack overflow. Generally, recursion should be avoided, but there are situations where it is the best, or sometimes the only way, to solve a problem. A good example is tree traversal algorithms, or performing a flood fill in a graphics application. Having watched this video, you should be able to answer the following key questions. What is recursion? And when might you want to use recursion over iteration?